Don't give up when someone denies you your right. Thank you very much. This is this month's legislative update. Continue pushing it a step forward. We two bodies are all not alike. Yeah. Right? If you give people the chance and the encouragement and some supports, amazing things can happen. Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to Disability Viewpoints. With me this time is Nikki Vincencio, our co-host today. Nikki, welcome to our show. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here. What great things are you working on and who are your guests? Well, today I get to interview the lovely ladies from the League of Women Voters, Jacqueline Kelly and Cheryl Bailey. Wow, and I bet they're in the audience. Yes, they are. Great, great. Well, I had, uh, I'm going to have Su uh, Susan Cush from the State Services for the Blind, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, the census and the different groups and the different ways they're doing their outreach and uh, why the census is so important to the disabled and some of the new TV commercials that are out and so on and so forth. So it should be a good, uh, good show today and we're glad to have you here. Absolutely. So we'll be back with Disability Viewpoints in just a moment or two. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to this edition of Disability Viewpoints. Well, our special guest today is Susan Cush from the State Services for the Blind. Welcome to the show, Susan, and why don't you tell the folks at home why you're here today? Well, thank you so much for having it's an me. It's to have you here. Today I'm here to talk about the importance of the Dicentennial that will be happening this year in 2020. I'm a chair on the Complete Count Committee for State Agencies and the Disability Work Group. Okay, and then... Why, tell us first of all why the census is so important. So the reason the census is so important, it only happens once every 10 years, and whatever count our state gets, we're stuck with for 10 years. Um, the seats in the state and the federal government are based off how many people are in our state, and um, the districts, the voting districts, are also arranged by how many people are in whichever area. So funding to communities um, is based on the count and approximately $28,000 per Minnesotan is distributed to us for things like the WIC program, um, home loan programs, the transit grants, um, highways, roads, community centers, that sort of thing. And so funding to um, the communities um, you know, is really, really important for these services. And then businesses also um, base where they're going to expand their business on a census count. So for example, if you have a lot of people in an area that weren't there before, you might see an Aldi's or a Walmart going up. And people that might say, well, we have a lot of people in our neighborhood. How come we don't have uh, Aldi's or a Walmart going up? And some of the time it's because those communities then are undercounted or there are people that are missed in the actual census. Mm -hmm. How is the 2020 census different from other dicentennials? So this will be the first census that uh, we can answer online and we can also call in on the phone um, and they still will have the paper copies um, but I think the big thing is is uh, everyone about mid-March will receive a notification in the mail with the link and a special code that um, tells them you know like how they can log on if you're not comfortable with using the internet and prefer to call your answers in they will have, uh, we just got about a list of 15 different phone numbers um, where, that will be published that people can call in and, and have someone help answer their questions. So when will the door knocking start if you don't complete your census form? So, well, I always encourage people, 
to answer the census the first go around. They will um, send out the first notification, then they'll send a couple follow-up letters, and if you still haven't answered your census by the end of April or the first of May, I believe it is, they will start having uh, field representatives or what's been known in the past as enumerators mm -hmm. come knocking on your door and try to get you to answer your census that way. Oh, wow. And then let's talk about data confidentiality. In this world of IT, that's a big issue. Yeah, so we're always concerned about that. And so um, I guess if it's really an issue for you, I would either call in or I would complete the paper copy. But more so what I'd like to mention is, is that the Census Bureau is actually bound by law to keep all of our answers that we give them for 72 years confidential. And being that I was a census worker three times previously, if I were to divulge any information that I collected when I was out doing door knocking, I stand a, you know, a jail sentence and a pretty hefty fine. So um, the Census Bureau does take the confidentiality very, very seriously. Who has been missed in the census in the past, do you know? Yeah, there's a lot of kids that get missed because people somehow think, I guess, that children under five um, don't need to be included on the census. There are people that are from different racial or ethnic groups, people that speak different languages, they get missed a lot. But really, why I'm here is because a lot of people from the disabilities are, are getting missed as well. And just from going out and speaking to people, the first question I usually ask is, have you completed a census in the past? Mm. And at certain um, events that I've been at, about half the people raise their hand that they have not completed a census right. previously. And then, and then how does that affect our disability community if we are missed? In other so words? as I mentioned, um, the funding that we get as a state for services. So I work for state services for the blind and we get federal funding to help people. And so if people aren't being counted, then uh, you know our funding could get cut and then we have less services to provide people. And it's not just state services for the blind on this complete count committee that I'm on. As I mentioned, people that have mental health issues or deaf or hard of hearing, people with developmental disabilities, people that are blind, any disability that you can imagine, they're on our work group. So really important that we get people counted. If, uh, if a census worker comes to our door, how do we verify in this day and age of a lot of scams going on? Absolutely. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we verify the census worker? That's a really good question. So what I always tell people is, is if you're not sure, um, take a business card from them. Um, you can call the regional, uh, the Chicago Regional Office at the Federal Census Bureau and actually verify that they're an employee. But really from being a past census employee, I can tell you that we carry a bag that has the census um, emblem on it. Um, I wouldn't ask you questions like, how much money do you make? Mm -hmm. uh. What your social security number is? <clears throat> your bank account? So if people are asking those types of questions, you mm -hmm. know that they are definitely not a census worker. I, I've noticed on our local news that some of the new census commercials are being played and they're well produced. However, it doesn't include the disabled community. Do you care to comment on it? Well, I don't work for the feds, no. which are who actually made those. Well, um, in other words, have you noticed? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've noticed that there's maybe uh, about you know one sentence that might be in ASL. I've noticed some of them are closed caption. Uh, they do seem to address different um, ethnic groups. But it does seem like the disability community was kind of left out in the yeah. production of those PSAs. You know, in some of the other commercials like McDonald's, they're starting to include disabled people or have for a while. 
and it would be nice. And I realize you have no control, over, but it would be nice well, from and a civil community standpoint to. to uh, and one of the yeah. things um, that our complete count committee just discussed with our regional federal contact this last week mm -hmm. was, um, do, are they going to offer any sen uh, disability sensitivity mm -hmm. training or education to the employees that are going out? So um, I actually have sent them a link. I got a link from a coworker of mine that kind of goes through a video that's maybe four minutes long and kind of shows people that have different disabilities and how we should be treating them. Um, not any different really than other people, but you know, the consideration that we should take. Right, and the different languages that are available, we have all different, a bunch of different ethnic groups now. Yeah, so I think the last count we had was there was about 59 different languages available. I do know that on the Minnesota 2020 website, if you go on there and you start typing in in Spanish, Hmong, or Somali, mm -hmm. um, that they will either answer you back in those languages or they will direct you to where you can speak to someone in that language. They also now have a thing where you can kind of commit to be counted uh, through your telephone by texting 66 2020 and then you type in count. If you're Spanish speaking, you would type in count in Spanish. Uh, same with Hmong and Somali. And then if you had any questions about what's going on with the census, you can actually text it and it's got like a bot or something that's answering the questions. Great, and uh, do you know a lot about outreach, how the 2020 census is working their outreach this time around? So I do know that specifically in Minnesota, we have had uh, complete count committees. So these are committees that are made up of different state or government agencies, tribal groups, nonprofits, um, and that's all across the state of Minnesota. And so basically what that is, is like people in different communities are coming together and trying to figure out how they can best outreach to their specific communities mm -hmm. about the 2020 census and making sure people are educated and informed and not misinformed or going off the rumors. Mm -hmm. What, and we're gonna do a final word segment here, a final thought. Any final thoughts on something that we may have missed this interview? Yeah, so one of the things left. that I didn't um, get to mention yet is that uh, one thing that they're doing this year that's different than the last Dicentennial, and I think they tried it, but it was unsuccessful, was they're going to have questionnaire assistance centers. So a lot like the um, little things you can go to at the library to get your taxes done, they'll also have these questionnaire assistance centers or QACs at libraries in different places around the state. And those locations are um, found on the Minnesota 2020 uh, census site. Okay, and do they have a website that you can give? Um, yes, I believe it's Minnesota. Uh, if you just type in Minnesota Census 2020, yeah. um, it'll direct you to their, their website. Great, again, that's Minnesota Census 2020. At this time, we'd like to thank Susan Cush from the State Services for the Blind for being with us today, and we understand she'll be back next time to provide more information for us. So thanks for being here. Thank you so we'll, much we'll for having We'll see you real me. soon on Disability Viewpoints. We'll be right back. Hi, Nikki Villavicencio here, and I have the privilege and pleasure to interview Jacqueline Kelly and Cheryl Bailey, and you're both from the League of Women Voters. Mm -hmm. And you know, everybody, anybody who has known me um, knows that I have a huge passion for democracy and making sure that everybody has a voice at the table. You know, mm -hmm. as a disability advocate, advocate, I learned really quickly that. Um, you know, voting is a huge and powerful thing mm -hmm. to do. It's the f first step into, um, you know, stepping into democracy is your public voice. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to hear from you two mm -hmm. about the League of Women Voters because I have had the experience of 
um, seeing some of the events that you've done, but not everybody has. And so I'd love for you to share about, um, first, mm -hmm. how you uh, got into the League of Women Voters. Mm -hmm. So I got involved with the league because a friend of mine was a league member and she said, you have to come check this out. It's great. It's just a great um, way to bring people into democracy and understand um, their power and their, with their vote. Um, and it's a great community building opportunity also to just find those people um, in your community that you might not know. Um, and work together, you know, on many different projects. So that's how I got started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I love about you, Jacqueline, too, is that you're, you know, you're a mom mm -hmm. of a person with a disability yeah. and a home care worker, and you're just a regular person Absolutely. just trying to do the best they can. Yep. And I think that's the important, you know, message for mm -hmm. everybody is you don't have to be an expert, right? Absolutely. This democracy is for everybody, and the league really stands by that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And Cheryl, how about you? How did you get into the league? Well, I retired from full-time work and started to realize I wanted some community involvement that wasn't just education-based. I've got two teenage sons, and school stuff was important to me, but I also wanted something else. And League of Women Voters has always had such a strong reputation for being nonpartisan, for being fair, mm -hmm. and for really wanting to promote civic engagement. And that just that really suited me. And I've been super impressed with the people who run the League of Women Voters, all of the volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, we just, I can't, I can't stress enough how excellent these community members are mm -hmm. at getting us organized and doing interesting programs. Mm -hmm. Awesome, so let's back up just a step and say, just for anybody who hasn't maybe came in, cr in contact with the League, can you just tell us a little bit like what the League does? What would a, an event look like? What you know? What do you guys do? Mm -hmm. Sure. So there, there's lots of possibilities there. Um, so one of the things that we do, for instance, is register voters. So we do a lot of community events and get out the votes, whether it's at you know schools, um, community centers, libraries, that kind of thing, and we get people out and just making sure community members are getting registered. So that's one thing we do. Um, Cheryl can probably talk more about programming and what that looks like. Yeah, we have a program committee, and so we try and figure out things that are of interest. Mm -hmm. Since we're in the League of Women Voters of St. Mm -hmm. Paul, we try and find um, issues that are important to people in St. Paul mm -hmm. and hold them uh, in places that are easy to access and that are um, of interest to people. So we've had events here in this studio. Uh, we have these things called DD and D democracy, democracy drinks and debate, mm. where we'll just bring a more casual topic up and have a speaker. We have one coming up in February mm -hmm. um, at a at a brew pub where people can just sit and listen to the Secretary of State talk mm -hmm. about cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to come up with topics that might be interesting to people that they could learn something from that are free and fun and interesting and um, lively. Mm -hmm. So that's been something that we do uh, with programming. Mm -hmm. And then we always host the candidates. We have candidate forums yep. when it gets closer to election time in election years. Yep, and along with those candidate forums, we also do like voter education um, and stuff like that. So just to help people understand um, who, not just who they're voting for as candidate, but like why, what that position means maybe and like mm -hmm. <laughs> why that would matter to them mm -hmm. to vote for. So those kinds of education pro uh, projects are rolled in that. We also have um, a youth voter engagement project too. So we're getting um, kids in schools to sign up and register their peers and other community members as well. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I haven't gone to one of your social events yet, mm -hmm. so I'll have to Come check have that one us. out yeah. sometime. Uh, you know, I've um, how I've interfaced with you is candidate forums, mm -hmm. and I think, like you said, it's so important to um, just help remind people of what each position is and why it is important that we vote for those things. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, whether it was we learned it way back in high school and, you know, I don't know, or, or maybe we didn't learn it at all, you know, maybe I'm a new, um, you know, citizen and I don't, and I, and, um, you know, whether, wherever you are, I think um, the, that information is so vital. Mm -hmm. um, 
One thing that I was wondering is um, what are some of the, of the ways that if you're sitting at home and you've never done this, how can you get involved? Like, do, is there a website that's really um, readily available to go search for all the events? Um, do you use social media mostly, or mm -hmm. is it an email list? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we have, um, you could look up lwvsp.org, and there we have um, one time or more long term, like volunteer opp opportunities. You could join as a member, which is really the best way to kind of find out and get involved because that way you'll be receiving newsletters and updates um, with events we have coming up and uh, have more engagement with some of like the, the member. Uh, activities like we have like a book club for instance for yeah. league members so some yeah, of that kind of clubs. stuff yeah mm -hmm. so we have that going on and then um, you know th yep the website is really the best way to kind of touch stone on all of that and we have plenty of opportunities for people yeah. that want to get involved um, all the way from uh, board membership to one-time volunteer opportunities mm -hmm. awesome sometimes community members will call and say we have an apartment building. We would love to get yeah. somebody from the league to come help us register people who live here. Is that mm -hmm. something that you could do? If you're on our list, then we can send an email saying, you know, mm -hmm. Wednesday from noon mm -hmm. till 4, could anybody come and help us mm -hmm. register voters? And it's yeah. just, it's really, it's such a good service for people. Mm -hmm. they, get, they get to learn about what it takes to vote in Minnesota. We have a wonderful state as far as voting rights. And it's very gratifying. And it's fun to meet people who live in your town. Absolutely, and you know um, that service right there, I think, is really vital too. Because mm -hmm. um, if you look at the numbers, a lot of people who live in apartments don't tend to have any um, access, or mm -hmm. don't they don't have as many much access right. to voting or learning, or they don't get door knocked. Mm -hmm. And so that service is really important. Mm -hmm. And I so I hope um, maybe other people hearing this will call you guys up and request to come to your building because I know there's a lot yeah. of senior buildings out there that would love the fact that you're a bipartisan organization. Nonpartisan, and, yeah. Or yeah, I'm sorry, nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. um, you've probably seen me around your apartment buildings because I'm constantly trying to slip our flyers <laughs> under even though it says no, no. soliciting <laughs> because we're so not soliciting. We're not no. trying to sell anything. We are really trying to be a resource for people and so mm -hmm. um, that's, that's just part of our community that's really important. Absolutely, you're engaging people in their Trying. right to yeah. vote. So yeah. that's so Absolutely. important. And uh, you know, the thing that um, I kind of fell in love with the League of Women Voters myself is the fact that it came out of the suffrage movement. Mm -hmm. right. And so I don't know if either of you have any um, in, or, you know, context around that. Mm -hmm. Can you say anything about um, the League of Women Voters and how that, that started, the, the suffrage part? Well, we're coming up on our 100th anniversary, yeah. yes. and so that's being celebrated all across the country, really, with the different mm -hmm. league chapters. Mm -hmm. Each each state's got their own league, and then each town has their own league. They've sort of divided up that way. Mm -hmm. So there are all sorts of celebrations. I think this Valentine's Day, the League of Women Voters is um, giving flowers to all the legislators mm -hmm. oh, to cool. try and bring attention to women's voices and women's mm -hmm. vote. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's been a hundred years, but I think uh, people of color were not still allowed to vote at that time. Absolutely. So white women were allowed to vote a hundred yep. years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always there's always another group that is still getting blocked out, and that's mm -hmm. something that League has really tried to be uh, aware yeah. of and trying to promote that we all get a chance to vote. Yes. We are we are citizens. We deserve that right. That's our that's our privilege to do. Yep, democracy is absolutely for every everyone. And in, everyone. in Minnesota, it started. In 1868, it started with trying to strike the word male um, from the uh, position of an elected official. And so we very first got our vote for as women to be able to vote in school board <laughs> positions. Yeah. And then it was much later where we got to apply for um, elected office uh, in libraries and vote in that. So it's been kind of a very slow roll but it's absolutely something that's still happening and, and democracy really is ev for everyone and League is really committed to that view. Mm -hmm. And I think the first vote by a woman was in South St. Paul. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a wonderful that is tidbit awesome. of Minnesota history. <laughs> yeah. The Landmark Center had a really good um, mm -hmm. uh, demonstration and um, project up mm -hmm. that people could look at and it had what our ballots looked like 100 years ago 
and they were pink and blue, believe it or not. Hmm. And uh, I, I believe that we had to say Miss or Mrs. on our ballot, not yep. first name, hmm. and then our husband's name if yep. we were married. So that was, it, it was just amazing that that's just not very long ago mm -hmm. that women were really not part of the scene, not part of the political mm -hmm. scene and not making decisions, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so I mean it feels like we've come so far, but we, and you know, the thing that I like to try to remember is that it's steps, each mm -hmm. step, mm -hmm. we're continuing to make a step, like mm -hmm. you, you were talking how the ballot is and, um, and um, you know, I hope that the disability community in this next election just comes out in droves and Absolutely. hopefully with the League yes. of Women Voters help, yeah. um, you know, you guys can be a resource to all folks with disabilities, not just women, mm -hmm. and in getting a, you know, nonpartisan mm -hmm. aspect of the election and mm -hmm. the, the value that it has in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a really important point. League is for everybody. It's not just women or any specific um, group or demographic. We are really for anybody that wants to participate in democracy. And wants to join us, mm -hmm. men included, young people included. Yeah. We really, we want to be relevant as mm -hmm. the ages go on, not just from what happened 100 mm -hmm. years ago. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on Disability Viewpoints and being my guest. Mm -hmm. And um, tell me the website one more time. It's lwvsp.org. And you could also just look up League of Women Voters yeah. of St. Paul. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Look at our calendar and join us for a beer next week. I will. Thanks, Cheryl. <laughs> Thank security. you, Jacqueline. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Nick. And uh, we'll be closing out with Mark and I. Well, that was a fast half hour, 28 minutes and 30 seconds is in real time. I want to thank Susan Cush from the State Service for the Blind for coming over here and talking about the census and how important it is to the disabled community and some of the new commercials that are out and the outreach and a whole bunch of, of uh, things that go into making the census a success. She, will, by the way, will be joining us next time with a little more information. And, and your guests were great today as well. Yeah, thank you, Mark. You know, um, I so enjoyed, you know, speaking to Jacqueline and Cheryl about the League of Women Voters and the hard work that they're doing to make sure that women and all marginalized people get out the vote because, as we know, how important that is, as is the census, okay. in making sure that all our voices are counted. So It's an important time for the disabled community now. Don't forget to stop by Community Tuesdays at the State Office Building on Tuesdays in the morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, during session and so for Nick of Vincencio and the entire team here at Disability Viewpoints and the folks at SPNN, Joanne Erbis included, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Disability Viewpoints. Bye for now. <laughs>